the New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. They don't count the worst-selling authors. No, they don't. They don't. There are too many of them. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the top of the pyramid is lonely. It, yeah, it's like any other pyramid. Yeah, we know that. If you do anything for 30-odd years, that's what happens. Our next guest is former delegate John Doyle, also a candidate for state senate now, and he'll have another job when he goes to Charleston in a few hours uh, also here. John, good morning. Welcome back. Uh, good morning to both of you, and glad to be back. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I want to get old business out of the way first. Is this the ambush? This is the ambush. Okay. Mr. Doyle, uh, you needed to correct something from a previous interview. <laughs> Could you bring us all up to speed on that, John? Yeah. A couple of days ago, when uh, Lucia Valentine was on, who's running in the 97th House of Delegates District, um, Mr. Gilstrap here mentioned to her that that district is historically Republican. It's only existed for one election. So I don't really think you can call that history historic. is history, John. <laughs> what happened? I mean, what for, happened yesterday? <laughs> for the entire duration of the district, what has it been? A Republican. There won you go. The one time. Okay, one in a row is is a trend when it's only one in a row. That's a hundred percent victory for the Republicans in that district. Your turn. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm just going to let that logic go. <laughs> What, what is the uh, registered voter layout in that 97th? I, I don't know, but, but, but here is the real history. John Hardy has been in the House of Delegates for several terms, and he represents it now. But after redistricting two years ago, it changed considerably. Uh, he was elected again. Uh, the, the district was solid red. Uh, but... About two-thirds of that district remains, About probably about 70%, well, about two-thirds of it. It's 70% of the new district because with redistricting, the numbers went down a little bit again, uh, the, the numbers per district. It was about 19,000 people. So he lost about, uh, about uh, 7,000 of the Berkeley County portion, and that was all red. And it's been replaced by 5,500 population from Jefferson County, which is blue. So it is a it, it is now what I call a reddish purple district. So it is a fundamentally different district. And the interesting thing is, uh, John Hardy was reelected two years ago. Uh, his opponent was a Democrat. He won two to one. But there's another factor involved here, and that is that his opponent was from the Jefferson County part which is only 30% of the population of the district. So you could just as easily say it was a geographic advantage that reelected John Hardy as opposed to a Republican advantage. I think it was a combination of the two. Because um, I've uh, around here, I have noticed that particularly between Jefferson and Berkeley counties, once they get past the political aspect of it, People who don't know both candidates well vote their geography. Mm -hmm. It's just a, 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 it is as important a factor as the D versus R factor. We especially see that in judicial races, John. I've noticed that to be a very big factor in terms of how people vote. Yeah. If you say vote their geography, what does that mean? If you're a Berkeley County resident and there's a, a Berkeley County in running and a Jefferson County ah. in running and you don't know either one of them very well, you'll say you'll vote okay. for the Berkeley County in. Yeah. And at the constitutional level, at the state constitution, what drives redistricting and the creation or elimination of state um, rep uh, districts, representational, representation, you know what I mean, the districts? <laughs> uh, it's totally up to the legislature. Oh, it's not driven by at such and such a population, it's time to do a new district or time to... No, no, no. It's it, it, what, what happens is, uh, and, and, and the legislature really, to a very great degree, uh, is the deciding factor in the number of seats in a given 10-year period. The state constitution, for example, says there will be a minimum of 12 Senate districts, and they shall have two senators. And in any county... In any district, senatorial district that covers more than one county, both senators may not reside in the same county. Now, we have 17 senatorial districts at the moment. Uh, when the Constitution was written mandating a minimum of 12, the state had about a half a million people. 
So it, it is uh, by that logic, we should have more now. Uh, I actually think it got up to 16 when the state had 2.1 million people. Uh, it got up to 17 shortly after that, and now we've been losing population. I wouldn't mind seeing both the House and the Senate uh, have reduced numbers. John uh, and uh, Larry Kump, Delegate Kump, is involved in this, too. We'll have him on the program Monday morning to talk about it. But there is a, a bill that may be introduced, may not be, but at least it's being discussed, of single-member Senate districts. I think that violates the Constitution. Uh I don't remember seeing that in there, but you may be right. You would probably... Uh, know, it's my understanding that, that this Constitution says minimum of 12 Senate districts and they shall have two senators. So you, I think that's what the Constitution to, you'd says. You'd have to do a constitutional yeah. amendment. Though. I would oppose it anyway on policy grounds. Okay, why? Um, I think you want as big a difference as possible between the House and Senate. That's one reason. Uh, so if so you, you have... Difference politically? Uh, and geographically, okay. In terms of size, now, I, uh, if you have, uh, and if you have single member Senate districts, it cuts each one in half. Mm -hmm. uh, what you would have is uh, th the Senate race I'm in would be about ninety percent of Jefferson County, and that's it. The other ten percent would be in a district uh, with uh, the bulk of it being in Berkeley County. Um, the uh, and so what you would have is one senator for about uh, every every uh, three delegate districts. I much prefer the two-seat district because that means a senator serves the equivalent of six delegate districts. That means that the, the difference in the type of, of population you represent is much greater between the Senate and the House, and I, I, I think that's a good idea is to have a big difference like that. Secondly, if the only way I would accept single-member Senate districts is if you reduce the terms of the Senate to two years. Because I think every voter should vote for a senator every two years. Do you think it should be two years, period, end of story right now anyway? No, I don't. I like the four-year term. I, I think for a long time I argued we had the dumbest House districting of, 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 of every state in the country but one, which was New Hampshire. Uh, we were the second dumbest after Maryland. Um, but at the same time, I thought we had the best Senate districting system of any of the 50 states, and I, and I, I want to keep it. The idea of, of two senators per district, four-year terms, staggered, I think is exactly the way we ought to do it. Well, now that we've gone to single-member districts for the House of Delegates, are you more favorable with one? Oh, oh I always had for... 40 years I advocated single-member districts for the House of Delegates. Yeah. Very good. We didn't have to change the Constitution for that. No, right? no. That no. just happened uh, from legislation. No, the, the, the Constitution simply says there shall be X number of delegates and they shall be apportioned. For a long time, uh, the, the, the legislature said each county shall have a certain number of delegates, mm -hmm. anywhere from 1 to 14. Kanawha County had 14 elected at large one time. I thought it was just really dumb. Uh, the uh, uh, and, and so finally, after the the '60s, the U.S. Supreme Court redistricting decisions, Baker versus Carr, Reynolds versus Sims, all of those, which came down to one person, one vote, uh, the state was told, "You can't do this anymore. Uh, you've got to have a system that has." a fairly close alignment in population from district to district every 10 years. Your thoughts on the LG announcement yesterday, John? On the what? LG announcement. LG moving into West Virginia in Huntington and in Morgantown with, uh, the, I guess you missed the announcement? I heard they were coming, but I didn't hear where they were coming. Yeah, Huntington and Morgantown, they're going to bring uh, jobs that pay $120,000 and a couple hundred jobs moving into the state over I the next couple years. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, the state will kick in $54 million in incentives, John, to LG. Uh, I am not a fan of anybody paying tax dollars to move anything into a state. I especially can't stand stadium subsidies for owners, <laughs> and I'm not a big fan of doing it with corporations. But this appears to be the only way to play the game in 2024. If you don't do it, then the state next to you gets the business. And for a $700 million investment, which is what I heard it is, 
54 million is actually a fairly small ask it does compared to what some of these other folks like Rockwell have mm-hmm. asked. It's uh, it's the way the game is played now. What will you be doing in Charleston as you're getting ready to head down now, there? I'm going to be lobbying for West Virginia Free, which is a women's rights organization, uh, strongly pro-choice. Uh, and uh, I, as you know, I am pro-choice. That is my record for the 26 years I served in the legislature. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, um, we'll, in, in ter- excuse me, in terms of specific legislation, we're just going to have to wait and see. I don't really know yet. I just came on board a few days ago. Mm-hmm. So I really don't know what bills might be coming up. I have heard that some of the folks on the Republican side might want to make the, the, the uh, on our abortion ban, which allows exceptions for, I think it's something like seven weeks for rape and incest for adults and 11 weeks for uh, those, I think, under 16. Mm-hmm. I have been told that some of the Republicans might want to eliminate those res- those ex- exceptions. That is or, the rumor, yes. Yeah, uh, or at the very least make them tighter. I do think that would be politically stupid on their part, but that's... You know. Have we had an election in West Virginia since the abortion bill was passed? We haven't, had we? No. Okay. So the, well, we're going to find out a lot about how, uh, how important this issue uh, actually is. Actually, we have had an election, the 22 election. Uh, was after that abortion ban was passed. Okay. Yeah. All right. I stand corrected. Yeah. yeah. What I so, think... Go ahead. Well, was, my, my question to you, John, as a person who will be lobbying for West Virginia Free, Yeah. in other states, we have seen a backlash against Republicans since Roe v. Wade was overturned. That's right. However, West Virginia, being a very pro-Trump, conservative state at this time, I've not seen or heard a groundswell of momentum for uh, revenge on Republicans for overturning Roe v. Wade or for abortion restrictions. Do you sense something otherwise? Uh, Yes, I do. And and here's the I'm I'm glad you mentioned that Uh, in the 22 election. It actually went in the opposite direction uh, from the rest of the country. And that is, in, in my opinion, because the state Democratic Party was afraid to raise the abortion issue. And I think that was politically stupid. Most of the people running for legislative seats would either say, I'm pro-life or try to run away from it. They did not take advantage of what I believe was a significant shift in opinion uh, that had happened since the court overturned Roe versus Wade. I think you're going to see a very different uh, uh, approach this year in in the in the state ele- legislative elections on the part of Democrats. So, do you you'll be running for Senate here? Yes, uh, coming up. Uh, well, you are. You've announced it already. Um, within your view of your pro- pro-choice stance, are there guardrails? Are, are there? Is there a time where it's too late to have an abortion? In your your mindset, let me answer the first question first. Okay. Yeah, there certainly need to be guardrails. I personally think Roe versus Wade had it right. For the first trimester, leave it up to the woman. In the second trimester, it's up to the woman, except the state can come in with certain restrictions. Uh, they can re- require all kinds of that require uh, evidence from a medical doctor or or that sort of thing. And in the third trimester, all only in rare exceptions would it be permitted. I think that is the general rule that we ought to have. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's uh, I, I'd like to see us go back to that. Uh, so. Um, I, I think we had it right, and we undid it. The court undid it. So what is – you wave a magic wand, you are in the Senate. So you're, you're going to be part of, of a minority with, within the, the chamber. How do you go about making those kinds of changes? It's a, you win hearts and minds one at a time. I mean, with the, the, the political mechanics of making that kind of a change, how would that work? It, it, I don't approach it as I, – I approach it as winning minds one at a time. Okay. Not hearts. I don't need to win your heart. <laughs> I just need to get you to, to explain to you in such a way that you say, John, you're making sense on this issue. I'm going to vote with you. 
It's uh, uh, and I, that's the way I've always done it. And I have seen back during the many years that I was in and the Democrats were in the majority. I saw Republicans able to pull that off. I'll tell you one who was a past master at it was, bless his heart, uh, the late Larry Faircloth, who just died a, a week or so ago. He was amazing. And he was a strong conservative. He would make these really strong conservative speeches on the floor. But after the session's over, he's, he's with a group of Democrats trying to say, here's my idea for solving this problem. And he's able to persuade them. It's a, yeah, I, 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 it's a, uh, he was amazing at it. And, and uh, uh, I've been able to do that to some degree uh, in the four years I was in when I was in the minority. Uh, I also think this. Uh, it's important for people to recognize that in a two-party system, uh, you need to have a minority party that is large enough to, if, to affect action. I talked to a fellow, what, 40, 50 years ago, um, uh, uh, from uh, uh, who, who is the uh, minority whip, uh, he, uh, uh, Bob Harmon from uh, Mineral County. And he said, we need about 35. This is back when he only had 13. He says, if we get 35, we can affect the outcome of legislation. And uh, that is, uh, uh, it, it, it's fine for the Republicans to stay in the majority. But if the Democrats can pick up a few more, which I believe they will this time, uh, I think you'll see, because uh, uh, always the majority party has factions that have divided against each other. That was the case with the Democrats when we were in the majority. It's the case with the Republicans now. It's just a fact of nature. So as a state-level candidate representing the, the Democrat Party, Democratic Party, thank you. Um, <laughs> we had this discussion <laughs> at length uh, representing the Democratic Party. Do you find yourself uh, compelled to run against the national Democratic narrative from the, the AOCs and the, the, the far left? That is not the, the national Democratic narrative. That well, that's what, what the wins media over, portrays there you go. as the national Democratic but narrative. But that's what resonates in within West Virginia, which is a far right state. Uh, but I'm running in Jefferson and Berkeley counties. I'm not running in West Virginia. Okay. The uh, people over here uh, pay a lot more attention uh, to national news and understand the nuances better than those in particularly the southern half of the state of West Virginia. John Doyle, our guest here on the program, he'll be lobbying on behalf of West Virginia Free in this upcoming legislative session. He's also a candidate for Senate, and that is in the district uh, where the seat is currently held by Patricia Rucker, I believe. That and is she's correct. being and challenged by Paul Espinosa in the De primary. Delegate Espinosa is running against her in the primary, and I yeah. just have to wait and see who wins. Uh, John, the state is on track to kick in another uh, 10% reduction in the personal income tax. Uh, $400 million revenue surplus, $400 million plus, is now in the bank for uh, this fiscal year as the end of December. Your thoughts on the track the state is uh, headed revenue-wise, and that includes the automatic tax cuts, which can trigger based on the math. I think it's a mistake. We need that money for better pay for public school teachers and school service workers and state employees. Uh, if, if we keep on treating them like serfs, we're not going to have very many. Already, public school teachers are, are leaving West Virginia. They're fleeing for their economic lives. We've got to have major pay raises for them in order to keep the ones we have. We've already lost too many good ones. We can't afford any more. Uh, I do think that the, 20 the, the, the tax reduction they did uh, two years ago would have made sense if more of it were targeted to middle and lower income people. The, uh, the higher up on the income scale you are, the more chance you will spend a tax reduction out of state. It's the folks on the middle and lower income who buy things here. Uh, it's it's uh, the higher up you go, the more you do things like buy stock and, and that kind of thing in, in corporations all over the world. Uh, that's a, uh, if, if, if you want economic improvement, from a tax reduction, target it toward the people who spend money here. Now, the purpose of this reduction is to completely and totally eliminate the state income tax, John. And I think that's a terrible idea. I, I, uh, I th I, I'm a three-legged stool person. 
Uh, and I was uh, uh, I was vice chair uh, uh, John Gilstrap of the finance committee for for ten years, uh, and then uh, for three years I was deputy secretary of revenue. Uh, I have learned a little bit about taxation, uh, and uh, I'm a I think the closest you can have to a balance between income taxes, sales taxes, and property taxes, the better off you are, because at times when one performs poorly another is performing well and it enables you to have a fairly even balance sheet through thick and thin and and therefore uh, your expenditures can be more predictable um i just uh, to me to uh, if you eliminate the sales tax we're going to have uh, uh, eliminate the income tax we're going to have a sales tax of something like 16 17 percent because if you look at the, the few states that do not have an income tax Every one of them has real estate property taxes that are through the roof. And I don't think people in West Virginia want that. I think people in West Virginia like the fact that residential real estate property taxes here are, are really, really low compared to the rest of the country. They're relatively so modest. You, you, you have to get the money to operate uh, to pay for public services somewhere. John, we've got a minute left. Uh, home rule for counties, uh, specifically with the option of passing a 1% sales tax. I'm for it, uh, particularly, and I'm for it, providing it has the provision uh, of, of a local option and a referendum, that it's passed by the voters. If the voters want to tax themselves, go right ahead. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I'm not telling a county one way or the other you can't pass an income tax increase on our sales tax increase. It's going to be up to the voters. Yes. If the voters want it, they vote it in. If they right. don't, they don't. Absolutely. And that's how it works. Yeah. It's a referendum. Yeah. John, good to see you again. Good to see both of you. Safe travels. And if there's anything else you need to correct Gilstrap on, on just to text me, I'll make sure I pass it along. <laughs>